Rebecca here. Welcome to Cherry Grove Baptist Church. This is Pastor Tim McCann, and our live broadcast will begin very shortly. Thanks for watching today, and we pray that you'll be blessed by the praiseful singing and benefited by the scriptural preaching of God's Word. Cherry Grove Baptist Church is located in the northwestern section of North Carolina. If you're ever in our area, we certainly would love to have you come visit with us. Our service times here at Cherry Grove Baptist Church are every Sunday morning at 9.45 for Sunday school, then 10.45 for the worship service. Every Sunday evening we begin at 6 p.m. and every Wednesday night we meet at 7 p.m. Thanks again today for watching our broadcast. God bless you is our prayer. Cherry Grove Baptist Church. This is Pastor Tim McCann, and our live broadcast will begin very shortly. Thanks for watching today, and we pray that you'll be blessed by the praiseful singing and benefited by the scriptural preaching of God's Word. Cherry Grove Baptist Church is located in the northwestern section of North Carolina. If you're ever in our area, we certainly would love to have you come visit with us. Our service times here at Cherry Grove Baptist Church are every Sunday morning at 9.45 for Sunday school, then 10.45 for the worship service. Every Sunday evening we begin at... all stand together, grab a green hymn book, and turn to page 19, page 19 in the green hymn book, and let me have some ushers, please. <clears throat> Amen. Well, it's good to see you here tonight, and uh, let me give you a couple of things by the way of uh, announcements, all right? What are y'all doing? What are y'all fussing about? We got 22 ushers up here. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> and that's a good problem to have. We're going to need that Sunday morning, all right? We're going to need extra hands to hold the I Love My Church offering, all right? And that's by faith, all right? I'm just saying by faith, huh? Yeah, the KFC buckets, we'll pass them around, all right? And, uh, and listen, if you give online, you got to let us know that, all right? So uh, that way, if, you give through, well, if you're going to give a big bunch, I wouldn't do it online, I'll tell you that, because it's going to charge you a little bit more, so... Uh, but we'll get all that compiled together, and, and I'm looking forward to a big day on that day. So April the 30th, uh, if you'll go ahead and make a mental note and a phone note or whatever, we're going to be singing for the cancer survivor, and uh, on the 30th, we'll give more details about that soon. Sunrise service this Saturday or this Sunday uh, up on the mountain, 8 o'clock, all right? So don't forget about that, and uh, it'll be a little different this year than we normally do it. There's just going to be one preacher preaching. And uh, that, that morning, and because of what I'm preaching that Sunday morning, uh, there ain't no need in preaching it three times. And so 
uh, we'll have one speaker and for about 20 or 30 minutes give us enough time to get up there and get that and then we'll get back down here uh, for a start everybody and change take your pajamas off and get your clothes back on all right and uh, so I do look forward to a good day that day we'll be having communion Sunday morning and uh, so be prepared for that spiritually and uh, we'll have that ready and to go that morning and uh, so don't forget about that and again I love my offering will be this Sunday and and I'll just tell you again the way that what what we're doing is everything that comes in that day uh, minus missions will go uh, directly to the building and that is this month's payment whatever comes in if it's a hundred thousand dollars it's going to the building all right if a hundred people give a thousand dollars that will be a hundred thousand dollars and uh, I know that's listen you're getting your taxes back and all that so just go ahead and make plans on that all right and uh, I believe we can do it. I believe we could really do it and if we put our head to it and uh, and and just just trust the Lord all right and so I love my church offering, ladies' fellowship. That's been canceled, so you mark that out for April Fool's Day. And um, that's not going to happen. Soul winning on the 6th, 1130, Mabry, Mabry Mill uh, for the 55 and Alive. So that's on the 9th. Don't forget about that. Sign-up sheet in the back. And uh, so don't forget to sign up. Let us know if you're 55 and if you're alive and you're going to go let us know, all right? And then they was telling me a while ago, I don't even know who told me. I've been told 10,000 things, but... Uh, when we come in, that Miss Linda Hawkins, the Jim, the guy she took care of, he passed away today, and uh, so if you would be praying for them and that family, and uh, in days ahead. All right, I think that's pretty much about everything. Am I missing anything? I don't see my other half in here, so uh, no, Jeremiah just raised his hand. So we're we missing anything else? Anything? Anybody? Anyone? All right, no service Sunday evening, so don't forget <coughs> about that. And, uh, and, and just pray for a good service Sunday morning, all right? And come ready to worship. We're not going to be here to worship a dead God. Right. Uh, we're going to be here to worship a living right. Savior. And so you come ready to worship, all right? All right, Justice, good to have you back, son. And uh, pray for us. Back, back that up one more time right there to Air Sense, all right? 
That wasn't in the original. Some of those songs, when you pull them up to put them in that to be the here, uh, you had to check them, and uh, that one I knew didn't have a verse in it, and uh, but I was like, well, evidently it ain't in the regular book neither. So, uh, but evidently it is in the regular book, and so, but anyways, next time we'll know when he's singing, our, you know, by himself a solo, it's just not up there. So, but anyway, so brother John, if you'll come here, uh, we're going to recognize a couple of folk tonight for their completion of the continued certificate and if we can get James Davis to come and uh, up here and receive his certificate James Lester, uh, James Lester Davis the uh, third senior Prince of Rome <laughs> and then uh, and then we have Miss Leslie Yass if you'll make your way up here we appreciate again all the hard work uh, everybody put into it to get through 14 weeks of uh, discipleship training. Thank you so much. And I uh, give them a round of applause again. <laughs> sort of what I'm going to talk a little bit hit about tonight, maybe, Colossians chapter number 1. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead. Praise him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. You continue praying for him, Lord. Heal him up. And uh, he'll make somebody a good church member and uh, with a good testimony. And so, Colossians chapter number 1 uh, tonight, I'll read you a verse here. And we'll spring into uh, with some other verses. And I want to share some things concerning the church. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm just talking about the church. And, uh, and, and I'm going to be preaching a series through some of that. And uh, of church, not Baptist history, not none of that, and uh, but just the church, the purpose of the church. I believe if there's something that's been lost in these last days, it is the purpose of the church, and uh, the power of the church, and uh, the people of the church, and uh, and and just several things I want to uh, connect you in on, and some of it will be elementary to you, and uh, but no matter what you may think. Uh, in our society today, one of the things that is trying to be redefined, we understand, is the home. And the home is likened to the church. And the husband and the wife, the church and Christ, uh, is, is all a picture one of the other. And, and so when there's a redefining of what the home is, and when there's a redefining of what marriage is, of course, ultimately, that's going to redefine what the church is. And, uh, and I want to say this evening that the church is a totally different uh, mechanism, an organism, organization, whatever you want to uh, call it, than any other entity in the, in the entire world. Uh, there's nothing about the church that, uh, that, 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 is, that is, should be worldly, if you will. Uh, there are business of the church, of course, we uh, have to tend to and take care of administrative side. And uh, that probably 99% of you have no idea about, all right? And thank God you ain't got to worry about it and deal with it, all right? And so only a few have to worry and think about those things and, and deal with that and be sure our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And, and, uh, and we may hit a little bit about that later. We're going to deal with the uh, preacher and the church, and we're going to deal with the church and the preacher, and we're going to deal with positions in the church and uh, of, of pastors and preachers and teachers and deacons. and We're just going to hit it all, not tonight though, all right? I'm just going to give you a layout, a foundation tonight of what the church is, what, what really a church is, all right? Because again, uh, everything's being redefined in this day and hour, and even the churches are being redefined of what a church really is. And uh, not everything that has a steeple is a church. And as a matter of fact, four walls don't make the church. You and I is what makes the church. And, uh, and so I hope it'll be a help and a blessing to you that you understand uh, when you study the life of Christ, and I hadn't got, I am doing that too. I was going to go into that next. And, uh, but in studying the life of Christ, I'm just going to begin with what he began with. I'm going to begin with what he loved most, and that's the church. And uh, the Bible said in Colossians chapter number 1, Colossians 1, verse 18, And He is the head of the body, speaking of Christ, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He, Christ, might have preeminence. And the Bible said in Ephesians 5, 25, that husbands love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. And so throughout your New Testament, and even in the Old Testament there's typologies, but throughout the New Testament you're going to find the love that uh, Christ has for the church. You're going to see the priority, the high priority, if you will, uh, that Christ puts on the local church and what He's designed it to do and why He designed it and who designed it. And He is the one that did design it. It ain't a man-made thing, and we'll say more about that in just a minute, but he designed the church with a function, all right? And we do have a purpose. 
And we do have reason. There's a reason we're here tonight. There's a reason that we'll gather uh, Sunday morning. And, and there's a reason behind us functioning. And, and basically, all in all, it would be so that we will learn to love one another. And so we will learn to invest in one another. And we will learn how to build up one another. And so we will learn how to worship Him and, uh, and really be enriched with Christ in our life. That's the purpose of church. And, uh, it's, it's not a business. We're not here to be in a bank account and to build up a bank account. We're not here to uh, try and take in all the money and hoard it up and wait till the end to see what happens. And, and, uh, but we're here because there is a function that God has called us to do and there is a purpose and a priority that He has placed on the local church. And so as you uh, study the word church, you understand that uh, it is the word ecclesia, uh, as far as the word being Greek that we get that from. And, uh, but when you look at a New Testament church, it is, number one, a local, visible assembly. It ain't some hidden thing. It ain't some underground. It ain't some secret society. It ain't some uh, uh, get-along gathering by any means. But it is a local, visible assembly. Most people in our community and in our county would say, man, there's not many visible churches in this day and hour. Uh, they may be local, they're just not visible. And uh, we are to be seen, and we are to be heard from, we are to be known about, and because we have a message for the world and we have a message for our community. And so uh, it is a place where born-again, blood-bought believers gather together. It's a local assembly. It's uh, membership would be made up of those who have been born again. It's not just for uh, anybody to come join, come as you are and stay as you are and leave as you are. And that's not who we are. A church, a New Testament church, is a group of people that's been born again, saved and changed by the grace of God. And uh, not only that, but when it comes to the New Testament church, we are separated from what we would call the state. And what I mean by that is a local church is under the direct authority of Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. That's our uh, text verse that we're uh, springing off him, that he is the head of the body, the church. It's not the state of North Carolina. It's not the United States of America. It's not even the Supreme Court of the United States that is our head. They are not the ones who govern, nor do they help us decide what we're going to do. And uh, we are separate from all that. The church is what we call in, in, in vocabulary autonomous. And, uh, and what that means is that we are free from outside control and free to answer to Christ and Christ alone. And uh, that's what we are. We are a, that's what a church was. It had nothing to do with the outside control. I had everything to do with Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. Colossians, again, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. And so when it comes to a church, you say, well, how does a church get direction? Well, it gets direction from the head. Uh, who's the head? The Bible said Jesus is the head. He is a direction giver. He's the leader of the local church. And it doesn't come from an association doesn't come from uh, the Southern Baptists meeting together and uh, trying to get a vision for 2024 and 2025 or the Catholic Church meeting together and uh, trying to put some plan together to get more people in the Catholic Church. It's not the Mormons that uh, meet every year there in Salt Lake and, and have their big Mormon days and put their uh, special underwear on and go do whatever it is that they do and try to figure out how they can lie and manipulate to more people and, 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 and have all these seniors and senoras and all these people of upper, uh, uh, upper crust people that are in control of everything. That's not who we are. Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. He's the head of the church. You're not the head of the church. He's the head of the church. And, and so I think in society today, we've uh, lost the ideal about who is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. He is the direction giver. And uh, he purchased this thing with his own blood. And uh, the Bible said, "...to take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of God, over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseer, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood." And so it's his. It's not mine. It's his. It's not yours. It's his. 
And uh, the Bible said, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And, uh, and so the church this morning, at the, or this evening, at the end of the day, the local church that uses the Word of God as their sole authority by faith and practices it is a real church, all right? Now listen, it's not perfect because it is made up of imperfect people. And, uh, but at the end of the day, as far as the head and the church itself, it is real. And it's a real thing, and it ought, to be, it ought to be a good thing for everybody to look at and to see in life. But Christ loves the church, and Christ wants to see His church grow. Charles Spurgeon said this. I thought it was interesting. He said, If I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I should have never joined one at all. Because at the moment I did join, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it. For it would have not been a perfect church after I become the member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, it's the dearest place on earth. And now listen, there's coming a day and there's coming a time. There is no perfect church. And anybody that looks for a perfect church, you're going to mess it up. That's what he's saying. And uh, there is no perfect church. The only perfect church is going to be when we get to heaven. And, uh, and when we get to heaven, we'll be in the midst of the perfect church. And uh, we'll be in the midst of a perfect worship. And, uh, but until then, God's given us a place that we can encourage one another and we can build relationships with one another and we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. People have always said this statement that I just don't believe in organized religion. Well, I don't believe in unorganized religion. And some would say, well, I, I just think... I think the church is, is all about man's idea. That's what I think. And the truth of the matter is, that's what many churches are. It's man's idea. And I read a preacher, heard a preacher say the other day, he was talking about our county, and he was talking about how many empty churches there is, and not just with people, but with pastors. And, and, and he was saying that if churches would get back looking for God-called men to come pastor their churches and, and would let them pastor the church and quit asking for uh, resumes and refer all this stuff you got to fill out and degrees and all this you got to have and just get back to what church really is about. Because, listen, at the end of the day, it's not about a man's idea. It's God's idea. The church is. The man's crept in and man's made it his idea. And so I want you to think about a few things tonight. Number one, the calling of the church. When we think about the calling of the church, it was an invitation uh, that was given by Jesus Christ. The Bible said, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets, and they followed him. And going from thence, he saw uh, other two brothers, James and son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the ship, and with Zebedee his father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father, and they followed him. And, uh, and so when we think about the calling of the church, this is the very beginning of it. This is the foundation of the church right here. Christ is the head, but here's the foundation. He's the cornerstone that everything else is built off of. Uh, but here's, here's the, the calling of what we would see of these 12 apostles. And Jesus calls these men uh, to leave the world and leave everything that they're doing and to come and follow him. And he called out Peter and he called out Andrew and he called out James and he called out John. And eventually he assembles a group of 12 and puts them together. And, and again, this would wind up being the foundation of his future church. And uh, the Bible said, and, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And uh, so after Jesus called out all these apostles, he commissioned them to go do something. And uh, he commissioned them to go minister. He commissioned them to go preach. He commissioned them uh, to go do a work for him. And the Bible uh, is clear that he gave them the power. Listen, these were just fishermen. I mean, these weren't the rich of the rich. These were not the know-it-alls of that day and hour. It wasn't men with great degrees. And these weren't men that... Uh, could put a big resume together about how great they are. They, the only thing they could say is, I was fishing one day and God called me. <laughs> and most churches wouldn't want that. And, uh, well, what have you been doing for a living? I've been fishing about every day of the week. 
And you smell like it. And you want a pastor? You want to be a preacher? And the Bible said, and when he had called unto him as twelve, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. There's a lot of things that these twelve could do. But the one thing they couldn't do was the ministry apart from the power of Christ. And he's, he's the head of this thing. He's the builder and the maker of this thing. And so uh, we see that Jesus is the inviter. He invited them to come. But not only is he the inviter, but he's the authority. And uh, the church has nothing to do with my ideal or your ideal or any other man's idea. This is his idea. And he was the one that, that, that established this thing. He said in Matthew 16, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, just before Jesus made this statement, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build a church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Peter had just made a declaration about uh, the deity of who Christ was. And uh, Peter just said that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And any time you see the word Peter, we understand that his name is Petros, and it literally means a rock. It doesn't, doesn't mean that Jesus was talking about him, that he is the rock, as Catholicism teaches. But in Matthew 16, 18, the, the word rock that he uses there is Petra, not Petros. And Petra, uh, and listen, I'm not no scholar, I just read books, all right? Petra uh, has the idea of a cliff. It had the idea of, of, of a projecting rock or a bedrock or even a large mountain range. And so what Jesus was saying to Peter, he wasn't saying that you're the rock I'm going to build my church on. He said you are a rock, but on the truth that you just spoke, you just said that I, I, Jesus, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is saying upon that statement, upon who you say that I am, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, uh, and so God said, I'll build my church on this bedrock. I'm going to build my church on this cornerstone, on this mountain range, if you will. And it wasn't Peter, it was Jesus that he was talking about of himself. And so God assembles the church. And uh, it wasn't founded on human authority. It was founded on his authority at the end of the day. And, uh, and so Jesus said that he must have preeminence in the church because he died for the church. And uh, that he might have preeminence. In verse 19 of Colossians 1, he said, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And, uh, and so Christ is the one who called the church. He's the one that established the church. He's the one that assembled and invited the first group of apostles to come. It is his authority and uh, it is his organized, if you will, religion or institution. And, uh, and then the apostles would begin to lay the foundation on him. And uh, everything was about him because he was the chief cornerstone. And so everything they would do from this point forward would be building off of him uh, because he was the establisher of it. And so number two, I want you to think about the composition of the church. And uh, the local church is not a building and it's not a location, uh, but it's a habitation for God's people. That's what this is. It's a habitation for God's people. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And uh, so the composition of the church is, this right here, is composed of called out people. That's what it is. It ain't elected people. It's called out people. And uh, the, the word that, uh, again, church being ecclesia, uh, the Greek, what that means was a called out assembly, if you will. And uh, 115 times he uses the word church in here, and, and he's speaking about 112 times of that, of this New Testament local assembly. And so the church refers to a group of people who have been called out, and not just somebody that come and join something, but it's a called out group of people. 
And uh, it's, 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 it's not just an organized religion, and uh, as some would want to call that, but it's a place where a called-out group of people belong to the Lord. And, uh, and it belongs to Him. We belong to Him. Everything we got belongs to Him. And all we do is just gather to worship and gather to praise and gather to uh, get our direction set on His direction. That's what we do. And so Jesus uh, personally called His disciples out uh, in this first century and uh, to establish and lay the foundation for what we would call the local church. First Peter said, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I think about the Corinthian church. Corinth was a wicked place. And, and, and if you go in and you study everything about it, the idolatry, the paganism, the, uh, they had houses of prostitution, they uh, had lewd rituals that was going on there all the time, and uh, one of the largest places of idolatry worship. And as a matter of fact, men uh, who would lose in races when they would race and compete against one another, it was nothing uh, for them to kill the man who lost in a race or any event that they would be doing. But yet, Paul would go and preach the gospel in Corinth. And when he did, people trusted Christ as their Savior. In the midst of a pagan, ungodly culture, God established what we know as a local church. Corinth was not a social club. It was not a Ruitan club. It was not a parachurch. It was not some uh, support group. It was a local church that God established. God called out a group of people, and He established this church called the Church of Corinth. And, uh, and listen, these people may not always have been perfect, and, uh, but Paul did write them, and Paul did tell them that, listen, you are a group of called out people. He said, Paul uh, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I don't know how to say Shoshan, this our brother, uh, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them uh, that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and heirs. And ours, and uh, and so Jesus is recognizing and pointing out the fact that Corinth, they were believers. They were those who have been set apart now, and uh, they had difficulties. They had sin in the church. They had a lot that was uh, going on there. There was a lot of struggles for them to gain the victory that they really needed. And uh, but their culture was so bad, and it was so influenced in the church. And uh, that Paul continued preaching to them. Paul continued uh, to teach them what was right and show them what was right, to teach them how to grow because that is what the local church is all about. And uh, a group of called out people and, uh, who have called on Christ for salvation. The Bible said, No, not uh, that so many of us, as we were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into the death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in the newness of life. And, uh, and so Paul taught them, all, all the churches that were planted, he taught them, you're called out people, you've believed in Jesus Christ, you are identified as Him now, you identify with Him through uh, baptism. And uh, baptism is a reflection on the outside of a work that was done on the inside. It'll never wash away your sin. It'll never change your sin nature by any means. And, uh, but it does identify you with Jesus Christ, that He paid a payment for your sin. And uh, so the church is composed of called out people. And then I'll say number next that it consists of a local assembly. And uh, the church is not a simply a universal of saved people, if you will, but it's comprised of local assemblies, of baptized believers. That's what it is. In Acts chapter number 9, we see multiple churches established in Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And the Bible said, and then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And uh, so here's, here's what a real church does. When, it, when, it, when you start thinking about uh, our connection to the church and what is God wanting us to do, real churches were functioning 
They were multiplying. They did not have councils. councils. They did not have uh, denominations. They were not independent, fundamental, premillennial, temperamental, judgmental, KJV, blah, blah, blah. Baptist churches, that ain't what they were. In the first century, listen, they didn't have no council. In the first century, they didn't have a denomination to run to. And uh, these were autonomous groups of believers that, that who, who had a biblical church leader and they functioned under the headship of Jesus Christ. That's what they were doing. And the apostles would teach them. And uh, they, they basically, uh, because there were no denominations, because there were no councils over here that, you know, the Methodists met here and the Presbyterian and the Baptists and the Catholic and the Mormon and all this, this, and this, and Jehovah's Witness, they didn't have none of that. And this is just a group of called out people. And, uh, and, and they were called out, and the apostles would teach them that, listen, <coughs> here's what Christ came for. He came to multiply. He started with 12, and, uh, and with those 12, they would lay the foundation of what everybody else is supposed to be doing, and, uh, and they said, listen, under the headship of Jesus Christ, here's who we are, and here's what we're doing. And so in a biblical sense, the universal church will be assembled one day when we get to heaven. And uh, I understand in prophecy, I understand that with this contemporary movement and all this that's going on in our world today, the aim and the goal of that thing is a one-world church is what they're shooting for. And a no division, no distinctions, no, no none of that. Come as you are, be as you are, think as you want, and a no truth, no blood. Uh, they said this week, I was reading an article that the Elevation Church here local, uh, or down in Charlotte, Elevation, and it's, they're a little bit everywhere. As a matter of fact, he used to be the president of the Southern Baptist Association. He's a non-denominationalist, but he's part of that. But anyway, uh, he said he was making a statement that this year that the Easter service would not have anything to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and listen, and people love that man. They love their music. They sing it in the independent fundamental Baptist churches of our day and hour. And, uh, and the man is saying, we will say nothing about the blood of Christ. We, listen, my Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. If no blood was ever shed, there'd be no... Listen, we'd all be going to hell one day. And, uh, and so for that mess, I'm just saying this. Listen, real churches are functioning to multiply the headship of Christ, and to multiply the vision of Christ. And one day we're going to get to heaven, and I'm sure there's going to be some Methodists there, and I'm sure there's going to be some non-denominationalists there, and I'm sure there's going to be a few Baptists there, and I'm sure there may even be some Catholics there that didn't know nothing, they just knew they believed in Jesus Christ, and their faith and trust was in Him, and they're going to be there, and that will be the one universal church, and that will be one assembly at the end of the day that Jesus called the glorious church. And the Bible says, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church, even as Christ so loved the church, and He gave Himself for it, that He may sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing and the water by the Word. Watch this, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Listen, I look forward to that day. And what we're doing now, we meet Wednesday nights. There ain't necessarily nothing in the Bible that says you got to do that. The only thing in the Bible I could say that uh, would go to that verse is, forsake not the assembling of yourselves as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another even so much more, so much more as you see the day approaching. And, uh, and listen, so I think Wednesday night's a good thing. And I think it's a good thing uh, to meet on Wednesday night. So I ain't saying it's a bad thing, but listen, there's coming a day and, uh, that he's going to present the glorious church. Two-thirds of preaching. Two-thirds of preaching. And I'll get into this when I get to the pastor's responsibility to the church. Two-thirds of a pastor's responsibility is to reprove and to rebuke. Ain't that crazy? That an under-shepherd... Uh, a shepherd that's out in the field with the sheep, he spends two-thirds of his time correcting the sheep. Just trying to get them to eat right and to walk right and do right and to stay away from the edge. That's what it is. And then the rest of the time, he can, he can, he can love on them and, and hold them in his arms and weep with them and cry with them. And uh, we'll say more about that later. 
But why do they do that? Why do we do that? Why is it important? Why are the apostles? Why, why is Christ the head of the church and not man? Because he said, one day I'm going to present this thing to the Father. And when I present it to the Father, I want to be presented a glorious church, not having spot, not having wrinkle, not having blemishes. And he said, listen, that's what I want in life. I want it to be holy and no blemishes in it. And we all look in the mirror tonight and we probably all got blemishes. But one day when we get to heaven, he's going to present us to the Father. This is my bride. And can I tell you the only reason there won't be no blemishes in it is because of who our head is. <laughs> hey, listen, all this other mess out here that has a head, all this, and listen, you know anything that has two heads is a what? A freak or a monster, right? And, uh, and listen, Christ is the head of this thing, and, uh, and if, it was, if, it was, if it was Buddha and, and all the other prophets of Buddha that... Uh, or if it was Charles T. Russell and uh, 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 these, these, these crazy Jehovah's Witnesses, they've had visions and visions and visions and visions, and Charles had more visions than, uh, uh, than Daniel did. He had more visions than any of the men, uh, Joseph did, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar had. I mean, he has visions all the time. He's dead. He's still having visions. And uh, listen, that, that means he's got the, that organization has two heads. And they got what's called the, the, the living world translation of the Bible. And, but here's the key to it. The watchtower trumps what the Bible says. And, and they believe in the Bible. They like the Bible. Their Bible's wrong. It's different. Matter of fact, they're the only ones that have it, that particular version. But at the end of the day, listen, they got two heads there. And they got one that can prophesy and say one thing. Until it applies to him, then he has to change it. Used to, you couldn't, you couldn't receive blood transfusions and all that stuff and, uh, when, when Jehovah's Witnesses started. And then once some of the leadership started getting see, sick and needing some of that and needing some medicine and needing this and needing that, well, all of a sudden, Mr. Russell had another vision. It's okay now. And about even in their own watchtower, it says no new truth can ever trump old truth. And, uh, and so they're doing that anyway. And so what I'm saying is this. There, there's, there's one head to the church, and that's Christ. And one day he wants to present us to the Father. And we look forward to that gathering when we get to heaven as the glorious church, the perfect church, the most perfect church that will ever assemble will be on that day. I think we have a perfect church, not in that you're perfect and I'm perfect. I'm just talking about I think we have a good role model of a church compared to everything else. And we have our flaws. I have my flaws. You have your flaws. We may not dot our I's and cross our T's every way that maybe we should and maybe expected of us sometimes, but I, I believe at the end of the day we're, we're trying and striving to be a glorious church. We're trying and we're striving not to have spot and blemish in us whenever we uh, uh, go to heaven one day and uh, we're trying to live that here because you can live that here. We're, we're a committed assembly now and uh, to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ. And if one day we're going to be without spot, if one day we're going to be without blemish, why not practice it now And uh, as we're carrying out the call of Christ on our life? So there's the calling of the church. There is the composition of the church. And then I end by this and saying there's a continuation of the church. This is probably where we're going to get real quiet. How, how did a group of first century believers grow and multiply? What's the best way of advertisement? What's the best way of advertisement? They got it right. Word of mouth. I just didn't hear none of y'all. I heard everybody over here. Maybe it's because they got a big mouth and y'all don't. I'm just joking. Word of mouth. That's the best thing. Listen, ain't it amazing that that... that the thing that worked in the first century is still working in this century? I mean, here we are in 2024, and I just asked you a question. What's, what's the best form of advertising? And you said word of mouth. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? He told them to use their mouth. 
And, uh, and so the continuation of the church, how, how, did they, how did they see this thing multiply? How did they see this thing go? And to the point at 2,000 and some years later, I mean, in Wilkes County, North Carolina, I can go outside and if my arm's feeling real good, hit another Baptist church with a rock. I mean, how, how did we get to that point of having nothing to having what we have today? The continuation. I'll tell you where it started with them, them disciples and them apostles. And they were, they, were, they were making much, not of being a Baptist. And I'm not ashamed of it. And listen, I, I'm always going to be a Baptist. I'm not taking it off our name. I'm not, listen, I'm not going to bash them. I'm not going to beat them unless they're Southern. And, uh, and listen, I'm not even going to do that. Uh, they're wrong in a lot of things. But I'm just saying, listen, I'm not ashamed to be a Baptist. But that wasn't what they was preaching. They weren't preaching that they were fundamentalists and independent and mission, uh, mission Baptists. They were not preaching that we're Anabaptists. They were not uh, spending years of trying to defend the King James Bible. They weren't doing that. That's all it gets done in the independent fundamental world today. That's all they want to talk about is, a, is a, I mean, listen, the Apostle Paul carried a King James Bible. What y'all thinking about that? It's all foolishness, it's all distractions, it's all, listen, it's all lunacy that the enemy, though it's a good topic and though we stand on it, we're always going to stand on it. But at the end of the day, it's foolishness. The Bible said just put to silence the ignorance of people. And it's an ignorant thing to argue about something that has no eternal value to it. I was saved under an NIV preacher, double married, living in adultery, preached the gospel. And I got born again. And some people would say that you're not saved. And I've met them. If I could remember the names, I'd say them. That because the King James Bible was not preached, and I'm not saved. And, and what I'm saying is this. The continuation of the church did not continue because of this mess. Over arguing about this stuff. It continued because there was a group of apostles who got a commission from Christ, I want you to take the gospel and preach the gospel and give the gospel. And I just believe if you'll do that, everything will be all right. Stay out of foolish debates. Foolishness. Now, I do believe, listen, there's things we got to hammer. There's things we got to call out. There's things that go against the church. There's things that go against the continuation of the church. I think there's things in our world today that's drawing crowds that has nothing to do with the gospel, though. It has nothing to do with the preached Word of God. It has nothing to do uh, with the seed being sown. It has everything to do uh, with, 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 I guess, putting on performances, leaving out that we're just sinners, leaving out the, the importance of the grace of God, teaching us to deny ungodliness, and to live godly in this present world, they don't preach that no more. They preach grace, but they don't preach that it teaches us to deny ungodliness. They don't do that. These, these, these men, these first century believers, they grew and they multiplied to a point that 2,000 years later, here we are with what we have today. And I'm talking about the gospel everywhere. How did they do it? They did it, number one, through Christ's commission. We understand, and we ain't ignorant around here of this, that as he ascended to heaven just before he did, he said to go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded thee. And lo, I am, all, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That wasn't a commission just to those apostles, I promise you that. Though he wanted them to take the commission and go do what it is he said do, but that, that commission, the reason we have what we have today is because of what they've done with it. And the only way that this next generation is going to have anything good is dependent upon what we do with it. And it's not just for them, it's for us. It was the foundation that they began to build the church with. They began to go and listen to Christ's commission. They... I began to take the doctrine of Jesus Christ that they had received from Him and give it to other people. The Bible said, Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. These apostles went about all the nations, and they preached, and they taught, and they baptized, and, and they began organizing churches and groups of people that would be local churches. And listen, today, today, we get the same privilege to do what it is they do. And though we may have churches on every corner, it does not, it does not exempt us from this command. It doesn't exempt us from missing on April whenever the date is for soul winning. It doesn't exempt us for that. And a matter of fact, it encourages us and it, and it ought to push us and prod us and command us that we should go and we take the gospel and give it to people too. And so they continued with what they did is because they took the establishment of the doctrines of Christ and they gave it out and people believed. But then I'll say this, not only did they continue, but watch this, here's, here's how they did it. They did it through the believers and their obedience. Listen, it, it's one thing this morning, this evening, to understand the continuation to understand that Christ gave a command. I, I believe everybody in here from the youngest to the oldest understands that. That he's got a command that we are to go. But listen, when it comes to Paul, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, listen, when it comes to all these Zebedees and, and, and what Christ told them to do, what he put on their platter to do, it's one thing for him to tell them that. But the reason we have what we have today is because they did it. They did it. They, they animated what they were told to do. They did it. They moved forward with what they were told to do. I was reading a story the other day about two fishermen, and they weren't disciples. And, uh, but they decided one Sunday, the weather was pretty, they'd been sort of having some withdrawals from fishing, pretty day, and I'm, we fixing to get the boat out and start it too. And they go do some fishing. But these, these dudes, they decided they was just going to go fishing on Sunday. And uh, one guy said to the other, they got out there on the lake, he said, you know, man, he said, I feel bad. I feel bad that I laid out of church and went fishing. And, uh, and that's pretty good. You know, you ought to feel bad if you lay out of church and go fishing, right? That other fellow said, yeah. He said, I know what you mean. He said, but I'll be honest with you, I couldn't have gone to church anyway this morning. He said, why not? He said, because my wife's at home sick. Some of y'all will get that here in just a little bit. Listen, people can miss church to go fishing. And, but, listen, they can go fishing, but they can't miss fishing for church. And they can't miss fishing for their wife being sick. Well, I'm saying, listen, there's a million excuses you can come up with. It's amazing, listen, I'm honestly, it's amazing how many excuses I've heard in 24 years about this thing. The excuses that we allow to keep us out of church, but not keep us out from fishing. And, and I mean, listen, we, we are faithful to this, we are faithful to that, we are faithful. And listen, none of that called us, none of that saved us, None of that shed blood for us. None of that gave us eternal life. None of that saved our children. None of that's going to help us in the difficult times. None of that's going to hear and answer our prayers when we really need God. But he's the first one that we let out on when it comes to this thing. Listen, I'm just saying this evening, the reason this thing was moved and the reason this thing has grown into what it's grown into is because there were some men that did not neglect what Christ had called them to do. They were faithful in what they did. The Bible said this when it comes to assembling. I, this was going to be my text verse tonight, but I knew I'd end with it. The Bible said, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now that's a good verse. And that's what we ought to do. Consider one another. Provoke unto love and the good works. That's what we're here to do. I'm, I'm here to try to provoke Charlie to do right. Joseph, do right. Quit doing stupid stuff. I won't say what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Stop. Listen, that's why I'm, I'm here to love them and to provoke them to love others. 
I'm here to do good to them and for them to do good to others. That's what the Bible said we're supposed to do. But watch this. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. This is Wednesday night. All right, I know that. As the manner of some is. So the writer is saying that there is a, there is a group of people of some. There's some some is's. That their manners is... They forsake church. They don't assemble together. They, they're, they're not considering one another. They're not provoking one another to love and to good works. He said, so not forsaking the assembly, as the matter of some is. There's some that's going to do it, and ain't nothing you, I mean, they're just going to do it. But exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Why is it that in the last days, the Bible said there's a turning away? There's a decline. Fifteen years of pastoring. Fifteen years. And in watching and preaching and knowing families and good families, and I believe godly families, listen, I've never seen a more, more of a day and time of decline, and I'm not talking about church attendance, but of faithfulness. The importance of assembling together. How has this thing stayed together this long? How has this thing been continued this long? It was continued because they continually, from day to day, from house to house, listen, they assembled together, they worshiped together. They exhorted one another. They considered one another. They provoked one another to love and unto good works. That's how it's continued. But we're living in a day and a time of the manner of some. We're just in that day and hour. But the Bible makes it plain and clear, yes, there's going to be a falling away. But the Bible said, as this day's approaching, you ought to assemble together even more, much more. If there's ever a time not to, not to be taking your uh, siestas and, and going away and doing this and doing it all the time and taking your children out of church, it's this day and hour. It's the last days. It's, it's the time when everything's declining, everything's dark, everything's doomed, everything's discouraging. It's in those days. He said, you ought to see the day approaching and you ought to be at church the much more. That's how church continues. It don't continue by declining. And so we've got to be obedient and stand for the faith. Proclaim the truth of what he's called us to do. The Bible said, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Listen, if truth is not preached, the church ain't going to go on. If it's not upheld by you and I as Christians, who in the world is going to uphold it? Who is going to do it? But God has designed this thing, this thing called the church and the Christian to be a guardian and to be a proclaimer of His truth. Christians have always stood for truth. I was thinking of some of these men, Peter and John, often arrested, threatened, beaten, Stephen Stone, Saul who would become Paul in prison, tortured. Herod beheaded James in prison, Peter. Paul was in prison. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was martyred. And it was all for the furtherance of the gospel, for the continuation of it. We could get into the Fox's Book of Martyrs. We could talk about, even, even in our day and time, the dark ages of, of the Anabaptists and of those who went before us. And they suffered much worse than... A lot of these guys did even in the Bible days. A lot worse. I don't know about you. I'd just seem to be beheaded as I would be strapped to a pole and set on fire. My luck, if I was in that day and hour, they would strap me to a pole, set me on fire, and then chop my head off. I don't know. Now, I wouldn't want to die that way. A lot of the martyrs of our faith were burned at the stake, drug around, crucified, but believers of the New Testament church have always stood for truth. 
It's, it's a heritage of courage and commitment to truth. Here, here's where we are today. I probably upset people while I go when I was just talking about forsaking not. But here's where we are today. We, we're just living in a generation that people don't value truth anymore. And I'm talking about this truth. I'm not talking about truth that changes from day to day. I'm talking about His truth. They just don't value it anymore. That, that, it, and it's evidence, it's evidence by the reaction. I mean, listen, the preaching that goes on in this day and hour, there's great preachers, great churches everywhere. And if there's great preaching in great churches and great uh, Sunday school and great... Listen, there ought to be a lot of great Christians and full churches everywhere. But what's the problem? Preaching is being neglected. The value of truth is being diminished. And, uh, and, and listen, people are becoming angry when they hear biblical preaching and biblical teaching on the Word of God. Why? Because it goes against their lifestyle. You can take, yeah, I don't know where about this here, but you take the Bible and, and you can go in here where the Bible says, and adorn yourself in modest apparel. You can try to teach men how to be modest in the way they dress and women how to be modest in the way they dress and uh, they're not to be uh, showing their skin and as far as, flo you know, just looking like that sack of taters busting out. And, uh, and it, it's not who we are. Breasts hanging out of their shirts and doing all that. And I can take the Bible and show you how to dress. I, matter of fact, I can take you to Proverbs and show you how the whores dressed. Because the Bible said that she wore the attire of a harlot. And you can learn that the attire of a harlot was, was, was the attire of, of promoting of herself, promoting of her, her body, her figure. And to be modest means that you're not going to draw attention to yourself. Listen, I could preach a whole hour message on that, and I'd make somebody mad. Why? Because I took the Bible, and it busted their bubble, and it made them mad. Down in Burlington, listen, every year, there was always a mass exodus to the beach. You're talking about running to the sun. That's what they, they did a lot of that. But I made sure, I made sure when they come back to blow out women wearing panties and a bra on the beach. It's the bathing suit, preacher. No, it ain't. It's your panties and it's your bra. It's what you would have on in the bedroom with you and your husband. And that's the only place you ought to have it on. You can take it off when you get it out with him, though. I don't care what you do. But it ain't made for the beach and everybody else to see. And son, I'd blow that out of the water, and I, they'd be so, our tithes would go down, uh, fellowship would go down, and, uh, and man, my blood pressure would just get higher, you know? And just maybe want to preach more. Maybe want to hit it more. And they didn't know that. They thought, listen, some people think, well, I'm just going to ignore the preacher. I'm going to treat him. And that's fine. What you do is fuel the fire. <laughs> listen, I'm just saying we're living in a day and a time, man. People, people don't want truth. They disdain it. They don't, they don't want it in their life. But listen, truth is precious. It's precious. It's worth living for. It's worth evidently dying for as these men did. And so as a member of a local New Testament church, listen, we are responsible for standing for truth. The Bible said in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, that thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Watch this. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou the faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Listen, through preaching, through Sunday school, through Bible studies, through discipleship, through counseling, through many other ways. Listen, the church has commissioned to pass truth along, to pass along. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Traditions are good, but they'd never trump truth. Never. And there's nothing wrong with having them, but you can't ever say, well, it's this way, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, it don't work that way. Truth always is what we pass on. And uh, listen, don't, don't, don't get in the place of saying, well, my grandpa, I'll tell you what, he, uh, he used to do this right here. Well, listen, that ain't what the Bible said, though, right? And so the history of the local church this evening, it began with Jesus Christ. He's the founder of it. He's the head of it. He's the owner of it. 
It's a, it's a group, a, a local assembly of saved people who have chosen to identify themselves with Jesus Christ. And they did that through baptism. And they did that through the life that they live. And we're going to learn more about really church and its privileges and its responsibilities as being members of churches and what that really means and what a New Testament local church looks like and how it functions and operates and, and to understand our responsibilities and, uh, and, and whatever area you're in, if you're just a sitting member of the church and maybe you don't teach, preach, sing, or do any of that, there's still responsibilities. And uh, listen, everybody's got a responsibility. And one of those is just worship. <laughs> you know, just worship. That's why we come here, we come to worship Him. And, uh, and so I hope it'll be a help and a blessing to you tonight, and I hope you get a better understanding of what church is and how we are doing what we're doing today. It's because of a commission that's been taken from centuries to centuries. Listen, and it's continued and continued and continued to where we are today. And I don't want to be the stopping point of any of that. I want to be just a springboard for the next generation to move on and go even further. Our Father, we love you. Thank you again for this day, this time. And Lord, we pray you bless your word tonight. Use it, help us, strengthen us, Father. And God, may we see the importance of the local church, Father, and understand its importance in our life, our family's life. And I can say this evening without giving a dime or a dollar that I, I love my church. And Lord, I'm thankful to be a part of the church. And Lord, I pray that you help us all, Father, to love our church. Love what you've established and what you've given us. And God, really, at the end of the day, it's just a hospital for sick people. And we come in here and we provoke one another to help one another, love one another, encourage one another. God, beyond these walls, we're commissioned to take the gospel, and I pray you help us do that. And Lord, the best advertisement is the same advertisement as when you left and went to heaven to go tell. And Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for the heritage and all that you've blessed us with. And I pray you continue blessing us, using us in these days. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen and amen. This and is Pastor Tim Kent. I want to take this time and say thank you for listening to today's broadcast and also tell you a little bit more about our church. We'll be back there tomorrow. And so pray for that. And then we get off go tomorrow and then they're out for spring break the next week. Our service times here at Cherry Grove Baptist Church are every Sunday morning at 945 for Sunday school and then 1045 for the worship service. Every Sunday evening we gather at 6 p.m. and every Wednesday evening we gather at 7 p.m. Cherry Grove Baptist Church has a strong desire to reach the world with the gospel. And if you've heard something today in today's message that has you wondering where you would spend eternity, we ask you to please contact us through our website, through email, or even by phone at 336-921-4224. We would love to help you understand how you can receive Christ and he can give you the peace that passes all understanding. And again, we want to say thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and may God bless you as our prayer.